everybody, you're listening to the latest episode of the Comic Book Bears podcast. I'm Billy Z. I'm Justin Allen. I'm Steve Morey. And I'm Matt Brossard. Unfortunately, Brother Brian is not joining us again tonight. Uh, life got in the way. I know we promised him, but he'll be back real soon. We promise, we promise. Don't we promise? We promise. Yeah. Totally. We totally promise. But in his absence, we have a very special guest tonight. And after an explosion, you're going to hear our interview with the fifth Beatles writer, Vivek Tiwari. Okay, everybody, we're back, and we are very proud and privileged to bring to the show Mr. Vivek Tiwari of the Fifth Beatle fame. Vivek has been a co-producer for a number of Broadway productions, including Green Day's American Idiot, A Raisin in the Sun, The Addams Family, and his Broadway productions have garnered a total of 25 Tony Awards, stemming from 44 nominations. But in terms of the comics world, he might be best known as the writer of The Fifth Beetle, the graphic novel that came out in 2013 from Dark Horse Comics with art by Andrew Robinson and a little bit by Kyle Baker. Vic, thank you for coming on to the show. It really is a pleasure to be able to talk to you for this next hour or so. Thanks for having me, guys. Okay, well, we do have a stock question for anybody who comes on to our show, and that is, how did you get into comics in the first place? Yeah, you know, I have been reading comics for as long as, literally as long as I can remember. You know, I often say that I probably learned to read by reading comics. I mean, my my earliest memories of reading are sitting on my mother's lap reading, uh, we called it Tauntaun, because my mom had a European background, but but in America we know it as Tintin. Um, so, you know, I, I often goof around and I say it was Hergé who taught me how to read. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I grew up reading, uh, Tintin books, um, to a lesser extent. I also read Asterix comics, um, you know, when I was a kid and I just, comics have always been with me. So I, I got into it, I guess, really to give credit where it's due through my parents. Um, but, uh, it's, that's, you know, ever since I was a child, I've been reading comics. Okay, and in terms of the fifth Beatle, if I were somebody who knew nothing about the Beatles, like, say, a Martian or a, <laughs> or a millennial, how would you describe what the terrain is that the fifth Beatle covers? Yeah, so the, the fifth Beatle, uh, you know, the subtitle is the Brian Epstein story, and it's, it's the story of the man who managed the Beatles. So as you said, for, if I was going to describe it for somebody who, who didn't know who the Beatles were, I would say, you know, it's about this, um, this, uh, 26 year old gay Jewish kid from a dirty port town in the north of England in the 1960s, which basically there, right there, you're describing the ultimate outsider, a, a young person with facing a tremendous amount of prejudices and personal obstacles, um, who discovers a local rock and roll band that he believes with his help, with his packaging and presentation could change the world. And he decides to take on the management of this band. He cleans them up. They're completely unprofessional when he discovers them. They're playing basement clubs, smoking on stage, drinking on stage. He cleans them up. He puts them in suits. He gives them an image. He gives, he suggests matching haircuts. And then he gets them a record deal when no one wants to sign them. He convinces Ed Sullivan to book them when a British band has never made an impact in the United States. He really engineers a frenzy around the band who we know are the Beatles. And that frenzy is called Beatlemania. Brian was the guy that engineered Beatlemania. And the world got the Beatles. And, and part of what's beautiful about that is in the Beatles, Brian saw a band that had a great message of love to share with the world. So again, for, for that Martian who didn't know the Beatles, <laughs> you know, he was somebody that, uh, that identified a pop culture phenomenon that was important, that was going to spread a lot of love and happiness and belonging into the world. And he wanted to, to make the, to spread that message all over the world. And, and he was the guy that, that made that happen. And in terms of Brian Epstein, what really attracted you to his story? Yeah. So, so I've kind of touched on some of this already, but you know, I, I grew up, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier that, uh, that my earliest memories of reading with my parents were reading Tintin books. Well, some of my earliest memories of, of being with my parents are also listening to Beatles music. My parents were huge Beatles fans. And I often say that I, I, I listened to the Beatles before I was born because, uh, you know, they played beat of the Beatles in the, in the house while my mom was pregnant. So I really grew up a, a huge Beatles fan. And when I found myself in business school in 1991, um, I was dreaming about working in the arts and entertainment industries and not
not finding a lot of resources at my school. I was at the Wharton School of Business, which now has quite a number of resources for young people interested in the arts. But back then, it really did not. And um, so I took it upon myself to kind of study the lives of the great arts and entertainment industry visionaries. And I thought that, you know, being that lifelong Beatles fans, I, I, I believe that the Beatles and Brian, their manager, uh, kind of wrote and then rewrote the rules of the pop music business. So that's what led me to a study of Brian Epstein. So initially, I was I was a business student looking for business stories. You know, as I, I, I wanted to know, how did he come up with the suits and haircuts? How did he get that record deal when no one wanted to sign them? How did he convince Ed Sullivan to book them when a British band had never made an impact in the United States? You know, those were the stories I was chasing. And I got those stories, and they were incredibly inspiring. And I, I could have stopped right then and there, and that would have been a great, a great, uh, worthy story to have uncovered. Um, but to get to the heart of the answer to your question, it was discovering his personal story, which I'll be the first to admit I wasn't even looking for when I began my research. I could have cared less about his personal life. But discovering that he did all this while being gay at a time where it was against the law to be gay, it was literally a felony in the U.K., Jewish at a time of pervasive anti-Semitism and from Liverpool and Liverpool prior to the Beatles was a port town that had no cultural influence whatsoever. So, you know, in Brian, you've got the ultimate outsider. And I, and I always say, you know, I never had those kinds of obstacles in my life or that that degree of obstacles. But when I found myself, you know, a, a young man in his early 20s of Indian origin, and I didn't want to become a doctor or an engineer or go into technology, which is the kind of things that young people of Indian origin who have some means are expected to do, you know, I didn't want to do that. You know, the Brian Epstein story really inspired me to chase my dreams. You know, I always say that the message of the Brian Epstein story is that no dream is too impossible and no person too unlikely to realize that dream. And when I found myself a young Indian kid who wanted to do something that young Indian kids are not supposed to do, that message was extremely powerful. So that's really why I've been uh, I've been stuck on the Brian Epstein story for for literally more than half my life. Okay, and also with your theatrical background, did you ever think about attacking it from that perspective, or were you thinking comic book from the get go? Yeah, it's funny. You know, when I first decided that, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I start I started the uh, studying Brian just for personal enrichment for for inspiration. You know, I wasn't doing the research to to write a screenplay or to write a graphic novel or anything like that. You know, so I started that about 25 years ago. And it was about a decade, you know, ago, about, you know, 15 years after I began my research that I thought I should tell this story. And your, your question is, um, you know, it's a, it's a really apropos one because at that time I was, you know, had achieved a lot of success in theater. And, and sure, my first instinct was I should do this as a theater piece. Theater is the world I know the best. And, um, and it, in some ways it would have been easiest for me to get it off the ground in that capacity. But the truth is, as I just, as I thought about how I wanted to tell the story, it just didn't feel like theater. It felt like a graphic novel and a film. And that's why from the very beginning, I thought of both. I thought this should be a graphic novel and a film. And interestingly enough, just a handful of weeks ago, uh, I got approached by some, uh, you know, it's, we're all in the discussion purposes, so I can't really drop names just yet, but by some very, uh, very interesting sort of avant-garde experimental uh, theater players um, who have a really interesting take on, on how we might be able to do the fifth Beatle in a theatrical context. And it's the first time. Uh, that I've ever actually been in. It's ironically, I come from a theater background, but it's the first time I've ever really been able to uh, to see a way into the story through theater. So who knows? There may be a theater project in it after all. But um, but really, in the earliest days from envisioning the project, I saw it as a comic and a film, although I, I would have loved to have done it as a theater piece from way back when. But as often uh, is the case with my career, I always seem to pick the hardest route. Uh, <laughs> but but the one that that also it's always the route that's the most satisfying as well. I'm determined not to earn my reputation as an interview hog, and I'm going to start passing the interview baton around to our other members here. So, Justin, what do you have that you'd like to ask there? From the panel at Baltimore, uh, you had mentioned that uh, you had uh, secured the rights for the Beatles music. Yep. Can you tell us how hard a little bit? I mean, you uh, yeah. how hard that was? <laughs> yeah, I mean, extremely. Uh, you know, it's something I'm incredibly proud of, and, and that's exactly right. Uh, so we're, we're turning the fifth Beatle into a major motion picture, and one of 
the the huge coups that we've pulled off for for the film is that we have gotten uh, the approval of the band, so the sign off of Paul Ringo, Yoko Ono, and Olivia Harrison, which paved the way for us to do a deal with Sony ATV, who control the music publishing, which is the long winded and technical way of explaining <laughs> that we got access to Beatles music for the film. And you're absolutely right; we are the first and only film to date about the band uh, to have secured their approval and gotten their rights. And when I say about the band, I mean a film about their history, a film in which the easiest way to think about it is the Beatles appear in the script. Um, if you've looked at that other Beatles movies like uh, Backbeat, about their early days in Hamburg, or Nowhere Boy, the recent film about John Lennon, um, you'll see that there's no Beatles music in those movies, and that's because the band has never approved a script before. So um, so I was incredibly proud that we pulled that off, and it was incredibly difficult, no doubt about it. I mean, it literally took me two and a half years. Um, you know, I, I often uh, say that it's, it's kind of like life imitating my art. You know, uh, in the Brian Epstein story, he got turned down by every single record label when he was trying to sell the Beatles. And finally, he, uh, he got a deal at, um, at EMI through George Martin. And similarly, I literally in my, in my files, I have four rejection letters, um, from the Beatles company, you know, a low, a low level person saying, uh, uh, you know, thank you for your request, but it's been denied. And then I thought, okay, well, I'm, if the low level guy says no, I need to get to the mid level gal. And the mid-level gal said no. And so I said, okay, I guess I need to get to the upper-level executive. And the upper-level exec said no. So I guess I got to get to the president. And when he said no, I was like, I guess I got to get to Paul and Ringo. You know, I just would not take no for an answer. Um, and that uh, that kind of persistence and determination for what really is a passion project for me eventually paid off. And, you know, it, it, it did. It, it took about two years to get their approvals and then about an additional six months just to, to negotiate the deal. I mean, once we got their approval it was still complicated to uh, to work out all the legal intricacies so um so it, it was a uh, you know to, to to be cheesy and quote a beatles lyric it was certainly a long and winding road um but but well worth the effort i think I, you know I, even though it is the brian epstein story i feel that if we were making a film about brian and uh, and people came and they didn't hear any beatles music um, they would understandably feel cheated. So, um, so I'm really proud that we uh, that we're able to tell the story properly and use their music. It has to be very satisfying to know that you do have the approval from the remaining Beatles in the family um, for this project. I mean, oh man, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a great thrill and an honor and and also a responsibility. You know, I take that very seriously. I feel that you know the film has to be great. I mean, we have to do right by this project, not just because I'm proud of my graphic novel and and it's a labor of love for me, but because the Beatles gave me unprecedented access. And you know, I I, I don't certainly don't want to put words in their mouth, and I don't know exactly why they decided to to approve it but but i suspect you know the, the way that it seems to me is in large part it's because that they care about brian's legacy and then they realize it's time that brian's story is told and, and if i can pat myself on the back a little bit i think they were were pleased with the way i was telling it um you know one of the great thrills of this throughout the, the history of this project was i, I got a, a note from paul mccartney um saying how much he enjoyed the graphic novel and complimenting andrew on his artwork and uh, and complimenting us on the way we were telling the Brian Epstein story. Uh, those of you who are listening that are Paul McCartney fans, you'll probably know that uh, that Paul is a huge comics fan, and so he really, he in particular, he really understood uh, what we were trying to do here. And to get a note from Paul McCartney saying that he liked something that I did <laughs> was a very very surreal day, and uh, and you know it was definitely a, a professional highlight of my life, no question about it, and a personal highlight as well. It was, a, it was a pretty awesome moment. Okay, well, you had mentioned artist Andrew Robinson, who is your partner in this project, and our resident artist is Mr. Matt Brozard. Matt, what would you like to ask there? I have to say that uh, The Fifth Beetle has a wonderful, rich-looking, uh, painterly quality to the visuals. How did you connect with Andrew Robinson, and how did you guys settle on a look for the the story? So, you know, it's um, I have, as I said earlier, I'm a huge comic geek ever since since I was a little kid, and uh, I didn't know Andrew uh, personally prior to the Fifth Beetle, but I did know him through his work. You know, I, I, being a 
comic nerd. I like knew all the artists and, you know, I was looking for somebody that was going to be awesome and was certainly going to, to be, do, to do right by the story and just do beautiful artwork, but also somebody who was going to be very collaborative. As I'm sure you could tell by this point in the conversation, the fifth beetle is a huge labor of love for me. Um, so this was a project where I really wanted to, to work with an artist. And because this was my first graphic novel, um, I also realized I would need a little bit of hand holding. You know, I might have some some stupid questions that a more seasoned uh, writer might not have of his artists. And so I really wanted to work with somebody that um, that, you know, wasn't going to say, hey, man, I've done this a thousand times over. Just give me the script and go away. Um, which certainly, you know, Andrew, given uh, given his talent, w- would have been well within his rights to, uh, to, to have that attitude. Um, but uh, I first contacted Andrew literally just through the business, through through his agent at the time. Um, and uh, and my initial interest was just knowing that that he could do it, knowing that he would do beautiful work. Um, but when I sat down with him for the first time, it was also clear that we were going to be very collaborative on it and that he really got the story. Um, he right off the bat said that he was a huge Beatles fan, but understood through the, my script that this was not about the Beatles. It really was Brian's story at its heart. Like, yes, it's a great Beatles story. And obviously the Beatles story is is uh, at the forefront of the fifth Beatle. But really at its core, it's about the guy that discovered the band. And Andrew got that right off the bat. And um, and it was clear that we were going to have a really nice back and forth about things. You know, my script is a it was an interesting beast. You know, there are moments of the script that are very detailed where I said, like, here's how I imagine it. And I, I'm thinking this number of panels on the page and I want the lighting to look like this. And here's the shots and here's reference photographs and, you know, really, really saying this is exactly what I'm envisioning. And, you know, Andrew's not an automaton, so he would often come back and say, well, that sounds good. But here's another idea. You know, we talk about it. But, you know, so, so there were moments in my script like that, but there were also large swaths of the script where I said, you know, I have no idea how to do this in comics. And here's the dialogue and here's what the characters are thinking and here is what they're feeling and here's the tone that I'm looking for. But you tell me, Andrew, like, how do we do this in sequential art in a way that's going to be captivating? And then Andrew would take that and run with it. So so it really was, um, you know, it was a it was an interesting process going through it with Andrew um, so, so right from the beginning, we knew that we were going to have a lot of discussions about it and really, um, you know, dig deep to come up with a, a look and feel that we were proud of. And, um, I will say that from the very beginning, I knew that for the, for the bulk of the book, I wanted something that was going to be, uh, like what we got, you know, something that was going to be painterly and photorealistic and very rich and that would, would capture sort of how these characters look and looked and the feel of things, you know, so that it wouldn't be caricature that it would, you know, not look exactly like the Beatles, that, that I wanted an artist who could give it their own, their own flavor, but that would be, you know, true to capturing what these icons look like and what, what their presence felt like. Um, on the same token, you know, I also knew that I, I had this seven page sequence that Kyle Baker drew and, um, and Kyle's sequence is short. Um, but it's almost, it, you know, I, I wanted it to feel like an insert. It, it, it pays homage to the old Beatles cartoons of the 1960s. Um, not the Yellow Submarine uh, cartoon, but the the cartoons that aired on television. So that's very cartoony. You know, it, it's that's car- caricature. So I knew that, like, I wanted these two polar extremes. I knew that the, the seven page cartoon sequence should look a lot like those Beatles cartoons, and the rest of the book should be the opposite. It should be this very painterly, rich kind of style. And um, and I knew that Andrew could do it, and and he he liked that approach as well. And and that's kind of how we we set about doing it. Well, it's very ambitious, and the effect is wonderful. Um, Thank you. It's, it's it's very unique. It, it's hard to place. You know, I can't think of a lot of other comics that have that kind of look to them. It's uh, I'm 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 you know I I had nothing to do with the art. Andrew was the artist, so I can't take any credit for it. But I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, Andrew really did absolutely breathtaking work on the fifth B. I mean, as did Kyle. Um, but you know, Andrew, who did the majority of the book, I mean, it, it really does literally just take take my breath away. Um, it took Andrew about four years to paint that book. Um, every single page is a canvas, is a painted piece of art. I mean, you know, we did not do this process with like, you know, a separate pencil or inker and colorist. I mean, Andrew did it all. Um, and it shows, you know, it took, took a long time to get it done, but, um, but it was worth it. I mean, the book, the book, you know, it, it looks gorgeous. He did, and, and Kyle as well. Kyle did absolutely gorgeous work on the cartoon sequence. I, I've been very, very fortunate, um, to have two absolutely brilliant artists, um, handling my material. 
And, you know, on that end, I hope I'm not sounding facetious when I say I, too, am a fan. I mean, just looking at the artwork of this book, I'm just a fan. Okay, well, I'm going to grab that interview baton from Mr. Matt, and I'm going to throw it over to Mr. Steve. Steve, what would you like to add? Oh, well, thanks for, uh, you know, having confidence in my catching abilities there for (laughs) for baton. So uh, you mentioned that there's been a lot of work that's gone into uh, producing the graphic novel itself. You had mentioned that Andrew had been working on the artwork for about four years and uh, that you had been really researching Brian since uh, you were in university, which is, uh, you know, a, a good a good chunk of time. How long would you say that you had you know, worked on bringing the script to life, finding Andrew and then finding a publisher uh, who would take on a project like this? Gosh, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I would say that we started working on The Fifth Beetle, you know, as a graphic novel about a decade ago um and i it probably took a buff you you know that that about it was about a decade ago that i decided to you know write a script and and start start thinking you know envisioning it as a graphic novel but it was probably i don't know three or four years into you know getting the script right and then finding andrew and then you know sort of getting going on the project um in terms of finding a publisher we were in a you know it's a it's a we were in a very fortunate um situation in that the way that it all is, they really came to us. You know, we, we never shopped this book per se. Um, you know, Andrew and I intended to make it, or Andrew, Kyle and I, I should say, intended to make it independently. Um, and, uh, and we, we never intended to self publish it, but we thought, let's get it made independently. And we knew that the Brian Epstein story was a great story and it's Beatles related and the Beatles always, uh, you know, generate a certain degree of interest. And I saw the work that Andrew and Kyle were doing, you know, taking myself out of the equation. I knew that the artwork was beautiful and we were just confident that we would find a home for it, that like we would make it and one of the, the great publishers would want to put it out. And that's what we intended to do. And it was about, uh, you know, Andrew must have been about 20 pages in and word sort of got out that we were doing this. Um, you know, Andrew and Kyle are both incredibly well-respected artists in the comic industry. And while I had never done a graphic novel before, um, you know, I had some notoriety in the, in the entertainment industry as the producer of, the, of shows like Green Day's American Idiot, um, The Addams Family, et cetera. So, you know, I was a bit of a known quantity in the arts and entertainment world. Um, and it's a Beatles project. So people immediately wanted to know, you know, what's this all about and wanted to see some pages of artwork. And then, you know, some of the publishers started calling and they said, are you looking for a deal? And I, I wasn't playing hardball. I was honestly answering the question like, I'm really not, you know, we were really just going to make it independently. But people started bugging us to see pages and they did. And then all of a sudden, you know, all the major publishers really were interested in putting the book out and um, very happy that we went with Dark Horse. They were incredibly passionate about it. Uh, Mike Richardson, the founder and publisher, is a huge Beatles fan, and he took it very, very seriously. And and as you know, and really from you know Mike, sort of the the top guy at the at Dark Horse, I guess. But from Mike, you know, he sort of set the tone. And from Mike all the way down, um, everyone at Dark Horse has been really passionate. From all the upper level executives straight down to the interns, you know, they've all really. Um, you know, treated this project a lot like like everybody has on it, which is that it's it is a labor of love. Um, so it's uh it's been a really great process, kind of putting it together. Um, but it did it took it took a number of years before we uh, we hit that place of cruise control where we were just kind of getting pages and working on the creative. You know, it, it put a while to get it took a while to to get it all together. Well, yeah, and it, it you know it just of course the result is uh is pretty stunning. So uh, congratulations congratulations on that. Now that we're coming Thank up you. on it. The two year anniversary of its publication, which is which is incredible. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. yeah. In just a few weeks it'll be two years. It's amazing to me how the book is still doing so well and still getting so much interest and it's really and, and it's you know, it's been wonderful to just watch it um, you know, sort of what watch new new fan bases kind of discover it. You know, I mean obviously right off the bat you've got Beatles fans and you've got comic fans. But, you know, the LGBT community embraced it and, and the Lambda Literary Foundation, which is, um, you know, sort of the highest uh, LGBT literary foundation, you know, named it a finalist for best LGBT graphic novel. You know, and the Jewish community are, are discovering it, you know, because they're embracing, you know, uh, the fact that Brian was a Jew, uh, you know, working in a time of great anti-Semitism and, and also at a time where, I mean, this might sound strange to modern years, but when Brian was doing his thing, you know, Jews didn't work extensively in the music industry especially not in the United Kingdom. 
Um, he wasn't the only one, but they were, they were few and far between. You know, that's obviously changed, uh, over the years, but at the time that was the case. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing to watch, uh, new, new groups of people discover this book, you know, and, and I love it when I, when I meet Beatles fans who tell me, you know, the fifth Beatle is the first graphic novel I've ever, ever read. You know, I love that because, uh, you know, as, as we all are on this, on this call, you know, we're huge comic geeks, right? And so, um, so to get more people reading comics, I mean, that to me is a huge joy and, and also, you know, a sort of secondary mission, if you will. And so I'm really proud of that too. Well, that's excellent. And, uh, you know, as a, as another comic geek, yeah, we need more people reading comics. And, uh, yeah. you know, of course the, the subject matter is just, is perfect for bringing new people in. And, um, and actually, you know, turning towards the work that you're doing on the film, um, you know, obviously it's, it's a little bit different than, you know, uh, working on producing something for stage or, uh, for getting, um, work together for publication as a graphic novel. Um, but do you think that all of this, uh, work that you've been sort of building, all the steam that you've been building over the past, well, 10 years really of the project, um, has really kind of prepared you for, uh, you know, pushing this through to actually getting the film made? Um, and it sounds, it, you know, it sounds like you're kind of, you're, you're well on your way because of course you've got the rights for the music and, um, you know, you've got a lot of interest, obviously, from, uh, you know, from from directors and from possibly uh, from other movie studios and working with us. Um, how is that process going right now? Do you uh, are you really excited about uh, everything that's been coming up? Absolutely. I mean, it. you know, it, the, this working on the fifth Beatle. You know, the, the amount of times that I've used the phrase, this is a dream come true. Um, you know, I've said it so often that I, I probably begin to sound like I'm, I'm being disingenuous, but <laughs> there have been so many, uh, levels of just, you know, another here, there's another dream come true, you know, and, uh, and that's really how it feels with the film. I mean, it really is coming together. Um, you know, I wouldn't say smoothly, you know, nothing is ever, you know, it takes a ton of work and I've been at it for a long time. So I wouldn't smooth might not be the right word, but uh, but certainly, um, you know, brilliantly. I mean, it's it's just so much fun. And everybody, as I said, everybody who's involved in this project is thinks of it as a labor of love. And um, and you're absolutely right. There's no question that having worked on the graphic novel so intensely all these years has, um, you know, has served me in good stead, both to like to have the, the stamina and the perseverance and the confidence to know that this story and the way we're telling it is is right. It's the right way to tell it. People are responding to it and and it's gonna be good. And so I've you know I've had the confidence to to put that message into the world for the film and and to to make sure that we do it right and to know that we're gonna get a director who's gonna be passionate about it. Because I I've known from experience that that if you wait and you do this slowly and properly, you will find the artist or whoever to, you know the creative team member that will be passionate about it. So, um, so that served me in good stead. And, and there's no question of the, the hype and the buzz and all the excitement around the book, all the awards it's won. You know, it was added to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I mean, all this crazy stuff that, uh, that has been showered on the book. There's no question that that has, um, has created a lot of buzz in Hollywood and within UK film circles. And that's also propelled the, um, the momentum of the film forward exponentially. You know, the, the, the truth is from the, the minute I envisioned the graphic novel a decade ago, I also envisioned a film. So it's a, it's a bit of a mistake to think that, um, you know, that we made this, this graphic novel and it did really, really well. And then, you know, all of a sudden now we're making a film or, or they, whoever they are, uh, you know, have decided to make a film in the wake of the success. And they is really we, you know, it's us and, 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 uh, you know, we're adding new and new people to the team every day, but, but, you know, that, that's a, that's not really the case. You know, I, I envisioned the film from the very beginning from from when I envisioned the graphic novel in the earliest days of this project. I had written both a graphic novel script and a screenplay, you know, and, and I was developing them both on parallel tracks. And at some point it became clear that the graphic novel was taking on a life of its own and, and would be finished first. And then so I shifted my efforts there and it was clear that the, the book would come out first. And as a result of that, it, it would inform the film. Um, but, uh, but it really, you know, the film is, has been a long time coming and, um, and it really is a dream come true to watch it all, all sort of, uh, you know, again, I don't want to say fall into place, but to watch it come together, you know, come together to use another, <laughs> another cheesy Beatles, uh, lyric. Um, but there you go. With the graphic novel being out and published, it's almost like you have a, a built-in storyboard and script sort of ready to go to kind of inform 
how the uh, how the film might look in the future. Do you th- do you kind of see a uh, you know maybe a, a new vision for the film, or would you like it to sort of follow the graphic novel, maybe the feel and the look? Yeah, so the the answer is kind of a bit of both. You know, d- definitely, you know, the graphic novel really captures the um, the look and feel and tone um, and the sort of balance of of you know it, it, it's a weighty story you know it's obviously it covers a lot of serious ground you know what it's like to be gay at a period where it's against the law brian dies at the age of 32 um never having had a proper boyfriend from an accidental overdose of prescription pills some of which were given to him to help cure him of his homosexuality you know these are all very heavy topics but it's also tied into to the Beatles' history and all the love and that that uh, unleashed into the world. And, and the Beatles were funny and they were fun. And there's also a lot of whimsy uh, to the story. So, it, you know, I feel like the graphic novel does a really good balance of capturing the seriousness and the weightiness of the story while also being very whimsical and funny in parts. And, and there's dream sequences and hallucination sequences and fantasy sequences. Those of you who read the book know that there's this whole matador image that kind of weaves its way through the book. And, you know, I want the film to have all of that. Um, however, you know, uh, we are not presenting the book as a storyboard for the film. You know, I do want a director that that loves the book and, and that, that gets the sort of what we did with the book. And, the, and again, the tone and the whimsy of it. Um, but I'm saying, you know, don't don't think of the bo- book as a storyboard. You know, I want the film to be its own vision. And, and I will tell you all the guys and gals that we're talking to, the directors that are who are interested there. They are all. Um, directors of note. They're directors who have vision. You know, they're not folks who are going to want to just take something that's uh, that's all there and, and shoot it. Um, you know, I think that what they did with Sin City was absolutely absolutely gorgeous. You know, Robert Rodriguez took that book and really used it as a storyboard and put the book on film, and it looked amazing and and it really worked for the film. That's not what we're trying to do here. You know, we really want a director to come on board who shares our vision and shares what we did with the 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 admiration for what we did with the book, but that is also going to add uh, a new sort of flavor to it and is going to add his or her vision um, to the story. So the answer is really a bit of both. You know, to me, if we were just going to try to take the book and put it on film for this story, it would kind of be like, why bother? You know, um, and I and I do want to if I could if I could riff on that for one more moment, uh, I do want to say that like I'm a, as I as I'm sure it's crystal clear by now, like I'm a huge comic geek, but I'm also a huge film geek. You know, I love film and I love comics and I really do appreciate that the two are different media. You know, there are certain things that work on the page that don't work on the screen and there's certain and, and vice versa. And so, you know, the graphic the film screenplay is not just the graphic novel script. Uh, you know, reformatted for, for a film. I mean, there are entire sequences in the film that don't exist in the book, and, and there's entire sequences in the book that don't exist in the film, and, and that is in large part respecting that the two media are different. And, you know, one obvious point right off the bat is we've secured music rights, um, as we discussed earlier. And I think Andrew and Kyle did absolutely, uh, uh, you know, inspirational, as I, the word I've used a number of times is breathtaking art in the book. And, and during those music sequences, when the band are in the cavern, et cetera, you can almost hear the music. I mean, Andrew and Kyle did such a great job there. But you can't hear the music, obviously. You know, it is a static book. Um, but in the film, you'll be able to hear the music. So one immediate difference is the film will have a lot more music sequences. Uh, you know, the book has only a few of them because we recognize that as much as Andrew and Kyle can do brilliant work, you know, and having a ton of concert sequences and music sequences in the book would get a little tiresome when you can't actually hear the music. Um, you know, so that that's sort of a very obvious example. And And the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, a mission of mine is to sing the unsung story of Brian Epstein. You know, as I've said earlier, his story really inspired me in my life. And I believe it's an inspirational human story. You know, that message, no dream is too impossible and no person too unlikely to realize that dream. That's a general human story that anyone all over the world um, can relate to and, and can can utilize that kind of inspiration. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I want to tell the most complete picture of the Brian Epstein story as possible. So to me, the film is also an opportunity to tell stories that we didn't in the book. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there, the book is a, is 128 pages and I did that on purpose. I wanted it to be a read that would be quick. I kept thinking about somebody discovering the book in an, in an airport bookstore and I wanted them to be able to think I could read this by the time my flight lands, you know? And so as a result of that though, there were a number of things that we left out of the book and, you know, the Pete Best story, the band's original drummer isn't really dealt with in the book. Brian's relationship with his father isn't dealt with as much in the book as I as I might have liked to. These are decisions I'm not sure I made the right one. But now in the film, I'm going to get to dwell on that a lot more. And uh, and there's also things in the book that aren't dwelt, uh, dealt with as much in the film. So my point here is if you're interested in the Brian Epstein story, I want you to be able to read the graphic novel and read the film and feel like consuming the two gives you a broader picture of who Brian was as a, as a person rather than thinking like, ah, you could read the book or you could see the film and it's going to be the same thing. So just pick which one you like better. You know, that's not what we're trying to do here. Sounds very like unique and complimentary that if you like one, then that'll bring you to the other and to just either flesh out something that you didn't see in the last one. That's excellent. That's yeah. great. Thanks. Yeah, if we do our jobs correctly, that that is exactly how it will, will feel. I was ready to ask that question about aspects of Brian's life that weren't reflected within the confines of the graphic novel that might be elaborated upon in the film. I'm forgive me if my rock geek is coming out, but yeah, it's there. Right on. I love it. Bring One it. of the areas that I am most fascinated about Brian Epstein's history was that period after he had gotten the notoriety from the Beatles and was pretty sure was deliberate attempt to make himself a star on his own. You know, whether it would be the appearances on Hullabaloo hosting British acts and business yep. dealings with buying the Seville Theater and, and all that. And I was wondering if you could comment on that, especially with, with your background as entrepreneurial in theater, if that was also something that attracted to you. Because for me, as uh, somebody who knows this story pretty well, that period from 65 to 67, I think there's a, a lot of fascinating things that happened to him that are completely outside of the Beatles, his management totally. of other acts. Yeah, so I was just yeah, wondering if you totally. could comment on that. You know, you know, we called the story The Fifth Beatle um, very purposefully, you know, and, and sort of in that within that title, you know, is the intimation that it really is going to focus on on the time he spends with the band. And, um, you know, I think that's the thing that that obviously draws people into the story immediately. I mean, it's what, you know, I make no no pretensions about it. it's what drew me in. I initially just wanted to know about the Beatles. I wasn't chasing Brian's story. So certainly, you know, we really do focus on the Beatles, but you're absolutely right. There's so many other fascinating things that he did. And that's certainly what has as one of the things that inspired me about, you know, chasing the story of his life. Um, cause I've kind of done that, you know, it's funny. I, I love what I do, but I, I recognize I'm, I'm, I'm a little spastic. You know, one year I'm making a graphic novel, the next year I'm producing theater, the next year I'm making a film. And I, I love that. You know, I'm really following my passions and it keeps my life interesting. Um, but I am a little bit all over the place. And, and, um, and Brian did that too. You know, he was a, a, a he, you, I mean, you know it. You, you mentioned some of this already. You know, he was a, was a, a theater guy. You know, he bought the Savile Theater in the, in the, in the UK in London and, and was a, was a sort of theater, big theater guy. And one thing that I don't talk about in either the film or the graphic novel, cause it's like such a tangent, but like, depending on who you ask, some people say that Brian Epstein invented the concept of the luxury car dealership, you know, and like how genius is that? And the quick story behind that was that as, um, you know, as the Beatles got incredibly successful and wealthy, you know, they wanted fancy cars and, you know, living in the UK, they might want Italian cars or whatever, you know, and so he had to import these cars and pay these ridiculous import taxes. And he thought, you know what, it's going to be cheaper and more cost effective if we just open up our own car dealership. And at this point in the Beatles lives, they're friends with people like the Rolling Stones and all those guys want to buy fancy cars. So we'll also be able to sell the cars to our friends. You know, and so he did that. He opened a dealership to, so that they could save money on importing all these cars and sell it to their friends who wanted cars. And so, again, depending on who you ask in the history of, of you know, the automotive industry, they will say that Brian Epstein Automotive uh, was the comp- was the first uh, instance of the, the the luxury car dealership. I mean, how genius is that? But, you know, again, you know, 128 page graphic novel, 
two hour film, you really got to be focused in, in what message you're telling and, and, uh, and what stories you're going to tell and not, not be too all over the place, or I think you'll lack a certain amount of cohesion and, and just kind of lose the audience. Um, so there are, there are a lot of really fascinating stories about Brian that we don't get into, but that there's no question there, there are equally the, uh, stories that, that have been, have captured my imagination and are part of what inspired me a lot about him. I have to say in prep for this interview, something I did yesterday was I listened to a 1967 interview with Murray the K. Mm. And I was, uh, first of all, I was surprised because, you know, my conception of Murray the K was just this yelling right. AM radio nonsense. And it seemed that, you know, the FM formatting that was prominent by the, if you call 67 the late 60s, it seemed to have infiltrated even him. And there's this wonderful hour plus interview with yeah. Brian and he's yeah, yeah. talking about bands that he has no you know business connection with like the monkeys and the Jimi Hendrix experience and the four tops and it's really fascinating hearing not just somebody who's in management but somebody who was obviously a fan of a lot of what was going on and it was totally. it was that interest that was keeping him in I was also wondering and again this is probably my most extreme rocky question uh when you were investigating for lack of a better word brian's life were there any other managers from that time that you found to be very interesting because there's a lot of great oh characters like whether it's led zeppelin's peter grant or don arden who was who's actually sharon osborne's father and his totally. stable with small faces so i was just wondering were there other managers that you thought wow maybe there's something here too oh man so many um, you know, I mean, and, and you nailed the one that is most fascinating to me outside of Brian, and that's Peter Grant, um, you know, the legendary manager of Led Zeppelin. I mean, he – what a colorful story. I mean, the guy was a genius. I mean, he's known – if, if people know anything about Peter Grant, they, you know, they think about these crazy stories that he did on, you know, uh, you know, managing the band on the road and all these ridiculous road stories that happened with Zeppelin. But he was also just a genius businessman. Um, so, you know, that's a fa- fascinating story. Um, and uh, the the sort of first managers of the Who, um, you know, Lambert and Stamp. Mm-hmm. And there's a wonderful documentary that was just uh, that just came out or, or came out, I don't know, sometime earlier this year called Lambert and Stamp that I encourage everybody to, to, to read. But Chris Lambert and um, and uh, Terrence Stamp. I mean, absolutely amazing stuff that they did for the Who. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, completely fascinating story. And you know, we touch on this a little bit in the Fifth Beetle, but uh, Colonel Parker, who managed Elvis, um, to me, that's the other extreme. I, I find Peter Grant and, and Lambert and Stamp to be, you know, inspiring stories. That there's there's stuff I can learn from about what to do with my life and, and, and enrich my life from reading their stories. Whereas Colonel Parker to me is kind of the opposite. I think Parker was, um, you know, uh, speaking poetically part. I think Parker was a vampire. And yeah. those of you who've read the fifth Beatle know that that's kind of exactly how we portray him in the book. Um, mm-hmm. the sequence that he appears in the book, he, he grows increasingly vampiric. And for those comic geeks in the audience, I, I will say that, uh, you'll, you'll get a kick out of knowing that, you know, one of my notes to Andrew Robinson as, as we were drawing, as he was doing that sequence is like, you know, make him look increasingly like a Temple Smith vampire. <laughs> um, you know, and I think Andrew nailed that pretty well. Um, you know, so, so the Colonel Parker story, but the, another amazing, uh, you know, rich and fascinating rock manager story. Just, it's just an ugly one. You know, I, I, yeah. I think he, it's the way he treated Elvis, I think was, you know, on one hand, he made Elvis his career. I don't want to get got off on too much of a tangent on that, but he did. You know, he mm-hmm. he really uh, he really made Elvis uh, so the success he became, but he also uh, sucked him dry in a lot of ways. Yeah. So really, just the 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 rock managers of the 1960s, just they're the, the it's so rich with story. I mean, it's these guys were defining the industry and, and they were turning, you know, Brian Epstein said the Beatles would elevate pop music into an art form. And I think they really did that, but there were a lot of bands that walked through that, the, the door that brought the doors that Brian opened mm-hmm. and, um, and the stories of how they did that and what they did with that once pop music was becoming an art form is just incredibly fascinating stuff. And I think with Colonel Parker, what you have there is the one extreme example of complete creative stiflement where Brian and some of the others that are – some of the other managers you mentioned completely encouraged that blossoming of creativity that happened at that time period. Yep, yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Just because because uh, I was talking very quickly and, and I, I always like to correct myself when I make a mistake. Uh, Lambert and Stamp, it was Chris Stamp and Kit Lambert. Right. 
her name. Right. So but I think Bryce said uh, – We understand that because Chris Stamp is Terrence Stamp's brother. Exactly. So, yeah. So. And for those of you who are listening closely, Terrence Stamp did not manage the, the hoop. <laughs> right. But Chris Stamp did. And so – and uh, and and truly, I, I really do encourage everybody to um, – to see the Lambert and Stamp documentary right. it's fascinating. And again, with Kit Lambert, another not so happy story in the end. So totally, and yeah. and really, in, in a lot of ways, not unlike the Brian Epstein story. Yeah, I mean, Lambert was also a, a very, um, a very flashy guy who liked being a bit of a celebrity and was gay at a time where it was was against the law. And um, and I think uh, I think he he I don't don't think I mean it's obvious that that he suffered from that. It was a very difficult thing for him. Uh, Justin, anything else you'd like to add? In a perfect world, who would you cast as Brian Epstein? Ah, uh, you know I'm, I'm gonna I, I hope you won't mind that I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Uh, and it's only because there are a number of folks we're sort of batting around and talking to right now. But you know the the the, the truth is the one thing I will say. Um, and this is this goes for for everyone, for the director and for the actor. It really is a matter of passion. You know, the the the, the best actor for this is the one that's going to be the most passionate um, about it. You know, I am I am B- Brian um, was not as iconic a face, at least not to people today. I'm certainly in the 60s. His face was 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 quite well known, but it isn't today. So I care less about finding an actor that's going to going to be a, a good look alike and I care much more about somebody who's going to capture the feel and the emotion and, and kind of what was what what it was like to be Brian you know somebody who's really going to be passionate about getting into his head and and uh, and portraying that story um that being said he uh you know Brian was 26 when he discovered the Beatles and he died at the age of 32 so we're also obviously looking at the crop of sort of younger actors um and the book is, uh, you know, the book is obviously a graphic novel. So, um, so people who are, are comic book friendly or fam, fanboy friendly are also, you know, sort of, uh, cropping up in, in, uh, in our talks. So I'm sure <laughs> with that, with that in mind, you could probably come up with the list of the 10 or 12 guys <laughs> on that uh, list. And, um, awesome. and I will say, you know, this is a good moment for me to, for me to plug keeping in touch, but, uh, you know, we have a Facebook page at the fifth beetle. And we're on Twitter at, at Fifth Beetle. And I, I really, I really am being serious when I say we take comments from our fan community very seriously. So anyone who has thoughts on who should play Brian or any of the Beatles for that matter, I'd love you to, uh, to post it on our Facebook page or, you know, uh, send us a message on Twitter and, and let us know your thoughts because we really do take that stuff pretty seriously. Okay, great. Matt, anything you'd like to add? Oh, I was just going to ask, uh, how can people find copies of the Fifth Beetle? How, how is it, uh, offered? Well, thank you for asking. Um, it shouldn't be terribly hard to find. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it should be at all the major booksellers, as they say. Um, online, it's certainly at uh, Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, um, IndieBound, you know, any number of the great online record stores. And uh, it should be at comic stores everywhere as well. You know, the book, um, you know, has done extremely well in the comic market, won the Eisner Award, won two Harvey Awards. Um, so, uh, so the comic community and the comic retailers have been huge supporters of this project. So there, there isn't a comic retail store that, um, you know, if they're not carrying it, that doesn't know about it. So certainly, uh, if I may, I would encourage anyone who'd like the book to go into their comic store first and please support your local comic book shop here, here, uh, and ask them to, to order it if they don't have it. Um, but, uh, but failing that you can certainly get it online as well. And Steve, how about you? Oh, nothing more to add other than uh, I think you had mentioned, you know, as Matt had said, there are uh, many different ways to get the books. But what formats do you actually have available? Ah, well, thank you for asking that as well. Um, so there are three formats of the book. There's the um, – and all, all three, I will say right off the bat, have the same story. Um, they're all hardcover and they're all on high-quality paper. Um, so any one of the three editions will do you right if you're just, just looking to, to get the story – um, and to experience the artwork, um, the regular edition um, is is the regular edition. It just has the uh, the story, and um, and again is in a nice nice hardcover format. Um, there is a mid level collector's edition, um, which is exactly like the regular edition, except it's printed on a sort of canvas cover and has a um, a fairly lengthy section of bonus materials. Uh, an art gallery section that Andrew put together, including early sketches that he did of Brian and the Beatles, where he was working through the faces and sketches where he didn't quite get it right and was still kind of working through it. Um, 
alternate covers that we liked very much but didn't think were totally right. And I love the cover we finally went with. But there were a number of really cool ones that we wanted a chance to uh, to share with the world as well. Um, and then I put together a section of um, of, B, of Brian Epstein memorabilia that I've collected over the years. Um, Brian's business card, um, an early Beatles poster when Pete Best is still in the band that, that Brian used through his record stores to generate interest for um, for the Beatles. You know, a number of really cool Beatles stuff. And because it's Brian Epstein for Focus Memorabilia, it's actually stuff that even a lot of Beatles fans uh, haven't seen. Um, so it's pretty cool uh, bonus bonus stuff. Uh, and then finally, there is a limited edition version of the book, and we only made 1,500 of those, and those are signed by myself, Andrew, and Kyle, and numbered, and uh, they're like the collector's edition. They have the um, – the, all the bonus materials, but it also comes with a wraparound cover uh, in a slip case um, and with an exclusive piece of tip-in art at the, at the front. It really kind of looks and feels like an art book. Uh, and as I said, we only made 1,500 of them. Um, and I do believe you, you can sort of – you can find one if you kind of go online and look for it. I don't think they're impossible to find, um, but they are, uh, you know, they are increasingly rare. Uh, and then I think we um, we may have discussed this earlier, but sometime next year, we haven't exactly set the date on it yet, um, we'll be putting out a trade paperback as well. And my hope is that the trade will also include some material from the film. You know, as the film gets going, um, there might be some uh, some additional bonus materials that we can uh, pull from the film that we can also include in the trade. So the trade would also not just be a rehash of something you've already seen, um, but that might also have some uh, some neat stuff. So we're going to wait until we have some – some, something special to uh, to put in the trade before putting out a trade. Okay, and then lastly, is there anything non Fifth Beetle related that's coming up in your world that we may be seeing soon? Yeah, thank you for asking. There's a number of other projects I'm working on, uh, and um, in, on the, from a writing standpoint, um, I am uh, working on a young adult novel uh, called Asha Ascending, um, and uh, it's about a um, you know so the, the log line. Uh, is, you know, in a world, you know, in a world where, um, where, uh, teenagers access the internet through surgical implants, uh, this brilliant girl coder has to help an irresponsible party boy, um, save his mother's life as they rush to unlock a code to immortality. I know that probably sounds very convoluted, but it'll make more sense when the book comes out. And while that is a novel, it is a YA novel, so it's um, it's not a comic book, it also is going to have uh, quite a bit of art in it. And um, the artist Sarah Richard, who's amazing, Eisner-nominated artist, um, she might be best known for her cover art for My Little Pony, uh, but she does a, a tremendous amount of work outside of that. She's not just a children's artist. Um, she has actually a Justice League tarot card set. Um, that I believe is coming out any minute now. She's amazing. You could go to sarahrichard.com to see more of her work. And she's collaborating with me on this novel. And, you know, the, the idea is that every 10 or 15 pages or so, there'll be a, you know, a, a beautiful piece of art that, um, that like comics will move the story forward. It's not just a piece of art that sort of, you know, serves as a chapter heading, but an art, a piece of art that, that is used for narrative purposes. Um, so I'm really, really excited about that. And um, Sarah and I are still discussing release plans, but our intention is um, maybe by the end of this the year or certainly early next year, we'd like to be able to start sharing that with um, with the world, maybe releasing a chapter at a time for free online just to generate some feedback from our fans and, and generate some early interest in the book. So um, so please do keep your eyes out for that. Um, my website is uh, tawarient.com, and, and I'm also on Twitter at, at Vivek J. Tawari. And I'm also on Facebook, and I accept every friend request of anybody who wants to follow what I'm up to. Um, so you'll be able to learn more about Asha Ascending through that. And then I do have a couple of comic ideas that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm flushing out right now. Um, but I would say that by the end of first quarter next year, um, you will definitely be uh, be hearing what my next comic project is. Um, there's a few things I'm, uh, I'm tossing around and, and in discussions with, um, with some really amazing, some of the amazing publishers. And, and so there's going to be something really cool to announce in the comic world shortly. And then outside of comics and writing altogether, um, I am also working with Alanis Morissette, uh, and we're adapting her album, uh, Jagged Little Pill for the stage. 
Um, I mentioned earlier I was one of the producers on Green Day's American Idiot. So we're kind of doing a, a similar thing, although the narrative will be very, very different. But the same concept of taking, you know, a very well-known pop record and kind of adapting it in, in interesting sort of avant-garde ways, for lack of a less cheesy way of putting it, um, on as into a stage musical. And so I'm really excited about that. I'm not writing that. I'm producing that. Um, but that's also a project I'm incredibly excited about and proud about. Hey, I'm excited to hear about it, too. That, uh... That album was my entire sophomore year of high school. So <laughs> it was it was a big record for a lot of people. I mean, you're not alone. You know, a lot of people have uh, have you know what say that that's not just an import a, a favorite record of theirs, but it was a coming of age record. You know, mm-hmm. it's uh, so I'm I'm really really excited. And again, it's something that I also feel a lot of responsibility for. You know, I try to take on these projects that that are going to inspire me and challenge me, but also things that I feel are a responsibility. Like I can't mess that up. You know, there are too many people who care about that record that I just, uh, you know, I can't mess it up. We got to do it right. Okay, great. Well, thank you again for coming on. I am hesitant to say good luck and almost throwing myself into theaters by saying break a leg, but uh, <laughs> okay. But that's how we whatever, say whatever well, parlance yeah. you prefer, you know, hope everything goes well with your development of the fifth Beatle film, Thanks continued so robust sales on the graphic novel. And we certainly hope that once you do have another comic book project announced that you'll come back on the show and talk to us about that, because I know we were restricted in terms of time, but I know, <laughs> I can think I can speak for all four of us that I we could go on all night. So thank you so much for coming. Very on kind there. of you, and I'd, I'd be I'd be honored to come back uh, as I as I roll out new projects. So thank you so much for the support. You guys have been amazing and following me from convention to convention. <laughs> just, uh, it's really really kind of you. So thank you so much. And we're back from our interview. That was a lot of fun. I could have talked to him all night. I love that book, and I love the subject matter. I'm really glad he came on, and I'm I'm dying to know what the next comic book project might be. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he laid it out that he was working on a couple different projects, so, yeah. you know, very, very interesting. Yeah, and I just do think from Fifth Beetle, he's just a, a natural storyteller from yeah. what we've seen there, so great well our segment that we use to wrap up the show is the woofs of the week segment this is the point where we spotlight something whether it be a comic book or a film or a charitable initiative or a kickstarter campaign lots of stuff under this umbrella that we can talk about we're going to go around the horn and we'll get the picks from each of you so let's start with mr matt brossard matt what is your wolf of the week Sure. Well, I'm really excited because there is an audiobook available for a book I'm a big fan of. It's by Dave White. It's called Exile in Guyville. And if you visit, he has a Tumblr page for this. If you go to exileinguyvillebook.tumblr.com, you can figure out um, the steps to uh, order the book. Um, and Dave's doing uh, an interesting uh, payment option where you get to choose your own price for the uh, for the audiobook. So um, th- it's riotously funny. It's very interesting. It's all about his uh, experience moving to Los Angeles uh, after growing up in Texas, and uh, it, it's it's super entertaining for uh, people who want to know you know his point of view and living in the gay community in Los Angeles and running into celebrities and you know all that kind of stuff. So uh, so check that out. Yep. And I would also like to thank Dave for sharing the Crime Fighter Inquiry Kickstarter link on his pages. So that was very nice of him. Oh, excellent. Cool. Yep. Okay. Mr. Justin, how about you? I would like to make a personal Wolf of the Week to my grandmother. She is 87 years old on the 11th of Veterans Day. And I just wanted to tell my grandma happy birthday. Awesome. Oh, we can't top that. Okay. (laughs) Steve, how about you? Well, I I was between two of them, but I'll talk about uh, the one now that Matt kind of broke the ice with an audiobook mention. There is a uh, an audiobook version of one of my favorite graphic novel series of all time, Lock and Key, that was just released last month in October. Um, And uh, on the long road trip, or not so long road trip down to Atlanta, uh, my husband and I were actually able to listen to this. Uh, it was available on audible.com now. Um, it is fantastic. Uh, fanta- 
It is fantastic. It's a, a very interesting way of experiencing Lock and Key that I had no idea was even possible. I know that they've been playing around with the idea of, uh, of a television series or a film adaptation, but hearing it as an audio play is just very unique of an experience. Uh, it's got a full starred cast. Um, Tatiana Maslany from uh, uh, from Orphan Black is in it. Um, Haley Joel Osment is also in it. Um, there's even a, an appearance by uh, Kate Mulgrew. Uh, it, but it's it, it's pretty fantastic, and it follows the book uh, or the the book series almost. Uh, I, I would say, if not word for word, at least page by page. Um, really hits all the high points. Uh, it's not very uh, abridged, um, but uh, it, it is a very unique experience, and I'd highly recommend it if you love the the uh, graphic novel series, or even if you weren't too sure about picking up the graphic novel series. It is still something to uh, uh, to experience if you are a fan of audio drama. Okay, well, I have a wolf and a wolf and a half a wolf. I would like to say that on the last show, we briefly talked about some of the Vertigo titles. And all I'm going to say is the Twilight Children is all of that and then some. We'll talk about that next week, but maybe not a wolf, but at least a roof. Okay, so so, so uh, look for that next week. It's a book that knocked me out, and I would not I would not table waiting to get that book by Darwin Cook and Jaime Jaime Hernandez. Right? It's not Gilbert. It's Gilbert Hernandez. Yeah, Gilbert. And actually, by the time this uh, this airs, I think the second issue would be out too. Oh, okay, that's that's true. Yes. So one and two, if you're in your shops. But my principal wolf is to all of the backers of the Crime Fighter Inquiry Kickstarter. We closed out this past Sunday night. Our final funding, we were at 214% of our goal. And uh, the three gentlemen I am on the call with right now are, are, are backers as well. So thank you, gentlemen. I would like to extend the thanks also to my partner in crime there, Mark Parman. Cannot wait to get this book into people's hands. I know it's a very personal wolf, but the beauty of crowdfunding is seeing people excited about what you have planned, even more than the money that comes in and the confirmation that something's going to move on it. You know, seeing that there is enthusiasm and goodwill is is wonderful to see. So thank you all. Woo! Congrats, Bill. Thank you. Now the the great work begins. It's very nice that we basically finished the first issue with just some finalized touches and that we can dedicate a lot of our time and resources to, from a business perspective, seeing what works best and scrambling to match a date. So I think we played this one right. So here you go. Okay, again, we are the Comic Book Bears podcast. You can listen to us on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio or on Podbean on various platforms. There will be some additional platforms that you'll be able to listen to us soon. We'll be announcing those fairly soon. Uh, you can reach out to us on our Facebook page, which is Comic Book Bears podcast. If you'd like to follow us on the Twitter and the Tumblr, and am I right, Mr. Justin, the Instagram right now? Correct. Okay. Uh, just comic book bears. You can find us as comic book bears. If you'd like to send us something, you can contact us through comicbookbears at gmail.com. Anything else we need to say? We're part of the Earth 2 Podcast Network. Um, anything else, guys? We cover all the bases there? Day is covered. There's Day's covered. covered. Day's covered. Day's <laughs> covered well with a, with a nice blanket. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm riffing on a film that doesn't even exist. Okay, so until next time, I'm Billy Z. I'm Justin Allen. I'm Steve Moore. And I'm Matt Broussard. You're going to hear a wolf and an explosion, and we'll be back again real soon. Take care, everyone. Whoa! My heart.